we've been talking about family guys and in 25 minutes I'm gonna wrap up part two of family I started out last week and I read Psalm 68 verse 6 and this is what it says to the fatherless he's a father to the widow he's a champion and friend to the lonely he gives a family to the prisoners he leads them into prosperity until they sing for joy this is our holy God in his holy place I also mentioned we briefly that there's no perfect family and, and I ask people if they have a perfect family raise your hand <laughs> and no hand came up and I said I wouldn't talk about anybody family I wouldn't make you feel bad and I would talk about my family but let's just talk about Jesus family for a second and we went through Matthew chapter 1 and we went through um, 17 or 18 um, lineages of, of, of his family we talked about Abraham who lied and said Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. We talked about Rahab, who was a prostitute, and she was saved. She wasn't even Israelite, and Joshua on her sacrifice to protect the spies. And the Bible says in Joshua chapter 6, from that time on, she was a part of the Israelites. Um, we talked about Judah, and you know, we know Judah as the tribe of praise and king of David. King David came from there, and Jesus came from there, all that kind of different stuff. But Judah um, had an affair pretty much with Tamar, who was his daughter-in-law, who disguised herself as a prostitute. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And this is Jesus' family, yo. And it's crazy that this Jesus' family, and God would use the imperfect things to bring the perfect one into the world. Amen. It's just like him using the weak things to confront the strong and the foolish things to confront the wise. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 to 18, it says this. Jesus, the Holy One, makes us holy. Isn't that awesome? You guys ever walk up here feeling nasty and messy sometime and like, Lord, I'm going to worship you anyway? You ever feel like, you're like, shh, boy. Ugh. I had to talk to a friend of mine. He's like, Felix, I don't want to come to church because last night I did this. And I'm like, bro, you better come to church because last night you did that. You know, and, and so we got to get this idea off of us that that we're working this holiness thing out. We are holy simply by one truth, Christ make us holy. And when we realize that we're new creatures because of our relationship with him, we begin to walk out that new creation life. The Bible talks of us that you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you be born again. That term born again actually means born from above. When God made Adam, he made Adam to see from heaven to earth. When Adam sinned, he swift to focus the earth to heaven. When Jesus Christ came, coming from the Father, and he said, this is how we pray, on earth as it is in heaven. He switched it up again. Heaven is the focus. And we're going to bring heaven and earth. So the real idea is, is that when you're in the flesh, when you're in yourself, you're singing earth first. When you're in the spirit, when you're walking by the spirit, the Bible says those that are sons of God are those that are led by the impulses or the leading of the Holy Spirit. We see heaven first. So when I see Jared, I see heaven's design over Jared first. When I see Bernard, I see heaven's design over Bernard first. I don't see the issues that I, I know that are true and familiar with Bernard. When I see people that God has brought in my life in their imperfections, what keeps my love on for them is that, God, how do you see them? And I begin to speak and minister and share my heart for them. No, that's my intention. That doesn't always happen. Because when you're born again, your spirit is born again, and your mind needs to be renewed. In Romans 12, it says that let your mind not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we may discern what's the perfect will of God. So what's happened? We're born again, and this, young, this might help the young people here. You're born again. You made that commitment. You feel that holiness, that sanctification one time, and now you got to actually renew your mind. That means you got to think heaven first over everything. And then you begin to feed your spirit, you begin to grow. So I just want to say that, that God makes us holy. He's the one that is making us holy because He's holy. And the sons and daughters, and as sons and daughters, we now belong to His same Father. That's amazing. Hebrews uh, um, 2 verse 11. So He is not ashamed or embarrassed to introduce us as brothers and sisters. Now come on now. Jesus knows everything about you and me. And He died for us. And He's not embarrassed. Now think of yourself on the worst day. Or oh, probably don't do that. 
on your worst day in the last year, think of yourself. And then think that God, Jesus Christ, still call you son, still call you daughter, still call you sister, still call you brother, still call you friend. And if he was going to introduce you to his father, he'll still do it in a heartbeat because he loves you. And that's the type of God we serve. Verse 13 says, And my confidence rests in God. And again he says, Here I am the one with the children Yahweh has given me their name. Since all his children have flesh and blood, so Jesus became human to fully identify with us. Wow, check about that. Jesus became fully human. Now everybody thinks that he did miracles because he was God. But he was fully human, led by the Spirit of God, and showed us how to live this life so we can partake of it. Now if somebody is God, if, God he, if he is God without the leading of the Holy Spirit, right? guess what happens? We applaud everything he does. We say, oh Jesus, you raised the dead. Good job, Jesus. Water into wine. Even better job, Jesus. You know, all the different stuff. Multiple Jesus. But Jesus did all that he did as man, empowered and fully led by the Holy Spirit. That's a different perspective, and that brings us into invitation to partner. And God doesn't want you to think small about your life because there's a big, big God living inside of you. The Holy Spirit. There's nothing small about your purpose and your destiny. So since all his children have flesh and blood, so Jesus became human to fully identify with us. He did this so that he could experience death and alienate the effects of this intimidating accuser who holds against us the power of death. By embracing death, Jesus sets free those who live their entire lives in bondage to the tormenting dread of death. What the worst thing could happen to you? You die, right? Maybe the worst thing could happen to you. Physically die? God said, I overcome death, I overcome sin, and I give you power over those both things. So you no longer live in your life in fear of death. You're actually living a life that is purpose-driven. So that in a blink of a second, whatever happens with you, you know, whatever happens, you know that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. To live for Christ, to die is gain. That's what Paul said. And so he's saying, I have overcome this. He goes on verse 16, he says, For it is clear that he didn't do this for the angels, but for all the sons and daughters of Abraham. This is why he had to be a man and take hold of our humanity in every way. He made us his brothers and sisters and became a merciful and faithful king priest before God. As the one who removed our sins to make us one with him, he suffered and endured every test and temptation. How about that? Not only, not only did he become flesh, God's begotten son, born of a woman, implanted by the spirit the only reason he was born with a woman the only reason why you are born through your mother and stuff like that is to see with your physical eyes into this world that is why you must be born again in order to see what the father is doing and to hear what the father is saying and to actually be led by what the father wants you to do nicodemus you must be born again but i got all the information i got all the law i've been to church I'm a leader. I'm a teacher. You must be born again. How can this be possible? I can't find my mother and go back inside of her. This is impossible. He said, no, you have to be born of the Spirit. So when he was led by the Spirit, the Bible says, even though he was in the flesh, he suffered and endured every test and temptation so that he could help us every time we pass through the ordeals of life. Wow. That should give you hope. You've been betrayed. Big Papa been through that. You've been wrongfully accused. Uncle Jay been through that. You've been tempted beyond the stretch. Try to get set up by the enemy. Ah, he been through that. You had to love someone that didn't understand your heart for them. Ooh, he been through that. You mean you had to forgive Matthew 18? Say, how many times have we forgiven Peter? God challenged him so much that Peter, you know, Peter, my boy, right? Peter always inter interrupt Jesus. He the brave one. Peter said, I can increase my faith. How do I do this? Do, no, what if what if Bernard tests me seven times? He offends me seven. What if Richard in one day offend me seven times? What should I do? Forgive him. But guess what? If he doesn't, if he offends you seven times seventy. Seven times seventy. You know how much that is? Four hundred and ninety. Now and all of you guys love me, right? I know some of you guys would never offend me 490 times in one day. And he's saying, 
it's not about the number. He's saying, as much as somebody forgive, um, offend you, forgive them, release them. You know what's the beginning of me forgiving someone? I think about how much I am forgiven. And that same parable, he talks about a man that owed, owed a king $10 billion. $10 billion. And then he said, listen, have mercy on me. Be patient with me. Give me time. I'll pay it back. The king in his mercy released the man. Before the man even leave the courts, he saw a servant of his own that owed him, guess how much? $20,000. $10 billion? $20,000. And he begins to rush after the guy and actually literally chokes the guy and tells the person about his debt and say, put him, lock him up. And other people that heard this or saw this went to the king and said, merciful king, do you imagine? How much Felix had owe you? Wait, Felix? You mean the $10 billion guy? Yeah. What happened? He just locked up Charlie for $20,000. $20,000? That don't make no sense. I just figured this man 10 billion. So he calls the guy back into the court and he begins to put him in the very um, slavery or tormentors to come and harm him. What am I saying? This, this is a parable. When we operate in unforgiveness, we actually be tormented by the offense. And every time, no, you might say you forgive someone, and I've been there, where I had to practice forgiveness by faith on a daily or weekly basis. Because guess what happened? You could actually relive that moment in your mind. People could be dead and we still relive in that moment in their mind. Our family members and friends. People that move on to another country that probably don't even know that we still, I mean, they're on Instagram living it up. And we depressed by offense. And God is saying, release them. Let me deal with them so you don't be tormented. Give that heart issue to me. And Jesus Christ had to do that with Peter, who betrayed him. He had to do that. He did that for Judas. You know, I tell people all the time, Judas would have been alive if he had waited one more day. Judas would have been alive if he had waited one more day. And so, guys, I encourage you, Minister, he suffered and endured every test and temptation so that he can help us every time we pass through the ordeals of life. So this must give you great hope. Romans 8 verse 14 to 17 says this, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. The mature children of God. Maturity. Pastor Austin came here two or three weeks ago and he said there's a difference between giftedness and maturity. Now, my son and my daughter, I was watching, I was watching Soleil interact with a couple people. And this is not because she's my daughter, but there was a young lady that's in her school and we saw them interacting. And the young lady, probably smart, probably awesome, gifted and everything. But there was a maturity level with my daughter that until that she came around her peers, I didn't realize how mature my daughter was. Because indirectly, I don't try to do this, baby girl, but I'm like, I'm, I could have in a conversation with my daughter, the maturity level is there. That's, that, that speaks to her character, that speaks to her health of her mind, her emotion, her self-awareness, all that awesomeness. And I'm saying, the Bible says the mature children of God are those who are led by the Holy Spirit. So if you're not mature, that means you're led by the flesh. But what does that look like? Romans 8 verse 14, it says, And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into fear of never being good enough. Oh, so you're saying, God, when I understand that I'm fully adopted, fully accepted, and whether I spend one day in your courts or a thousand days there or whatever, that I'm accepted and that I do things by faith out of your love for me instead of religious duty. So there's a discipline we all practice. Read the Bible. That's awesome. Pray. That's another awesome. But if we do that to have a checklist, we miss the point of doing it. Anytime I approach the Bible as a duty, I don't get to know the person who wrote the Bible. I just get to know a lot of information that I can say, like, puff, you know, I puffed up and say, how about information? I can quote that, I can quote that. No, no, no. That's not the, the whole thing about the Bible. The Bible is given to us so that we may know the perfect will of God for our lives, so that we can get to know the author, so that we can see ourselves through his lens, so that we can be renewed, so that we can love a world that needs our love and our heart. And so it goes on and says, For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as He whispers into our most, in our most being, You are God's beloved child. And so in this family unit, God is our Father. And the Holy Spirit, because we're born again, some of you guys made a decision yet last night, we're born again, 
it hits us with an impulse that you are a beloved child of God. But I just curse. Why are you going to work on that? Because my Bible says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has been raised from the day, the grave, you shall be saved. Well, well, your, your belief will have to catch up with the reality of God's eternal truth for you. You are saved. And as you begin to see yourself not as a sinner but a saint, you begin to listen to saint music, guys. You begin to have conversations that saints have. You begin to minister as a priest and a king because God calls you as a priest. He says we are all part of this royal priesthood. We're all kings and we're all priests. You think it's the hip hop world that calling you guys kings, my little king? No, God has been calling you kings from a long time because he gave every one of us a territory, a realm to rule and to impact the mountains of this earth. And once we realize, he said he's the Lord of Lords. CJ helped me out on Tuesday. Lords of Lords mean you are Lord and he's above you. A lord is a person who had a territory and a realm of influence. It's like a miniature king. And we're royal. So God not calling you to be employees. For God so loved the world that he wanted sons and daughters, not employees. He's not trying to give you a 4.0 out of 5. Come on. He wants you to be a son and a daughter, to be awakened to the DNA that is inside of you that you can live out of your inheritance. Now check this out. And verse 17 says, And since we are his true children, we qualify to share in all his treasures. For indeed, we are his heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. What he's saying is that, listen, you know what sufferings are? Then the Bible says, take up your cross. Let me, let me put this in as much as I can, I can take. He's not talking about literally looking for suffering in your life. He's saying, as a believer, there's a prince of the power of the air that works in a, something called the second heaven or the second the realm of the demonic oppression. There's people that because you are the light that operates in darkness, that's going to challenge your faith. And sometimes you might have to give up a friendship. Let's be honest. I don't want to give up a friendship because of Jesus. Did you regret it? Because the Bible says anyone that loves the world more than God or loves the world, um, the love of God not inside of them. So what, what does it mean that he's not talking about a physical world um, where, where people live. He's not talking about the people in the world. He's talking about the system that operates. I got to think about me, 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 me. No. When you're born again, you're thinking about we, 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 we. You're thinking about us. You're thinking about your future. You're thinking about how you're going to operate in this family. And so... What I realize is this, the sufferings is a part of the destiny pursuing purpose that you have inside of you that you're going to have come against. The suffering is part of those giants that you're going to have to slay in order to get to your destiny. There's always a giant between your destiny. Dogs of doom, dogs of doom bark at the doorway of destiny. So you might say, Pastor Felix, I have some challenges, man. You know, it's like, well, because you're moving in the right direction now. Dogs don't bark at cars that stop and a dog. <laughs> but when you park a car, so finally you will park all your life and now God awaken you and you driving and you and you get frightened. No, you in a car? You in a kingdom? You divinely protect. Just keep on going because God is with you. Last couple of points. What is the blessing of family? In family, we get to know the Father's heart and voice. Guys, think about it. When I was a young pastor, I was going on a mission, and God gave me a dream about my house when I'm not there, spiritually and physically. He said, a person that's not operating on the divine covering of God is like this. And he showed me my house with all the doors open so people could have access to it. Now, when a person isn't operating in family, covenant on family, spiritual and physical family, with a father and mother covering that, their soul is like that. And, 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 and listen, it, you, don't even, you don't even want to steal, but you just walk across the house and you see, wow, oh, that's a 46 inch TV, but, ooh, cuckoo. <laughs> Nobody there. But when you're operating in family and the father, father God is the head of your house, 
The enemy could come and peep and he did guarded by Jesus. <coughs> and every corner, your soul is protected. But when you walk outside of that covenant of family, then guess what? You open up yourself to be afflicted and tormented. A friend of mine texted this on our Facebook the other day. He said, demons are so powerless that they need you to open up a door for them to torment you. They can't open up no door for themselves. They waiting for you to bite the bait of Satan, whatever that is, and get a grip of your life. When you adopted into family, you need to begin to hear the Father's voice for you. Because you need to know what Papa sounds like. He says, um, in John, he says, I am the good shepherd and the sheep know me. But if, if we want to be a sheep of another flock, then we might be listening to the wrong voices. So I can think of a couple reasons because um, why is it important to know the Father's voice and his heart for us? I can think of a couple reasons because there are other voices that speak to us. I was watching a, a movie with Bernard and Nikolai the other day. It's called Push. You ever watched that before? It's on Netflix. Action movie, sci-fi. And one of the gifts of an individual is that they can push their thoughts inside of you. I could look at Jared's eyes and be like, hmm. <laughs> and I believe that's how the enemy tried to work. He tried to, he tried to push his thoughts and his agenda on you. And this is why we need to be in the spirit. This is why we have to be led by the spirit and see from heaven to earth instead of earth to heaven. Last couple of verses. Now, I wanted to share this with you real quick. Jesus is our model for this. In Luke 3, verse 21 to 22, it says, One day Jesus came to be baptized along with others. As he was consumed with the spirit of prayer, the heavenly realm ripped open above him, and the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the visible, tangible form of a dove and landed on him. Then God's audible voice was heard saying, This is my son, my beloved son, through whom I am fully fulfilled. Now here's the thing. If Jesus needs to get the approval of the Father, how much more so you? If Jesus, supernaturally being born of the Spirit, born unto a virgin, adopted by Joseph, I mean at 13 or 12 years old, got lost in Jerusalem, spent three days talking to rabbis. I mean, we know this young man is called and blessed. I mean, and he still needs the heavens to open up and approve him? How much more you need to know the Father's voice? Then I put on it says, we, we got our affirmation and purpose and, 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 and pulsated through the entire being by hearing the heart and the voice of God spoken over us and for us. He is so pleased with us. Guys, you need to know Father is pleased with you. He loves you. He loves every one of us. The enemy tries to rob us and try to critique us. No, 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 no. This is not a, an appraisal. This is adoption. And adoption means whether you like it or not, you will come sleep in my house. You might not have a job, but I have a job, so you go eat. And you're going to inherit everything I have when you begin to think like the father in the house. When you begin to operate out of love and honor. When you don't do that, then son, you're still operating as an orphan, even though you're a child of God. And the orphan had nobody but the state to protect them. And I don't think the state does a great job with orphans. God called us into family. He birthed us into it. And He wants us to hear His voice, to hear His heart, and begin to receive it and release it. So when I understand community, why is Pastor Felix not talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Why is Pastor Felix not talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit? Why is Pastor Felix not talking about preaching and teaching and witnessing? Because if you don't know you're adopted, you can't get other sons and daughters into this house. If you don't know you're adopted, you can't fully communicate the love of God. You can go to the Bible. You can go to the Romans world. But then after when you walk away, when that person sees you operating like an orphan, they'll be like, he's not the real stuff. But the Bible says that we must taste and see that the Lord is good. When we went away to Argentina, some of the things we were do eating, we had to smell it first. <laughs> that natural, boy, mommy, that chicken tastes good. I smell. You start to smell it, then you begin to taste it. But God is saying, before you smell it, taste it, just bite into my heart for you. And when you bite into my heart for you, all your senses are going to be awakened. And you're going to know that I am true, that I'm real, that I love you, that you're adopted, that you're forgiven, that you're blessed, that you're freed, and that you're walking in a greater anointing than ever before.
Last scripture. He brings us into family to establish the foundation of his voice in our heart. You ever have a family member that grew up with you and the traits and the culture are the same, even though they left and come back? Like I like I love to see the expatriate community in Cayman. There's something about their they raised up. They raised up. They raised up. Strong in the identity of culture and who they are as a Canadian, an African, an uh, English person, oh, a Swiss, you know, a Cuban, you know, a Spanish person, jam rock. You understand, Mr. Dean? Listen, listen, and all they need to know is that you from there and you begin, to, you went to St. Mary? Yeah, man. And I was like, what if Christians begin to value this kingdom like that? Whoa, <laughs> hey, Richard. You know Jesus too? And you, you know that, and, and you know what, come, come on, don't worry about that, I'll take care of you. And we begin to operate like family and culture instead of employees and employers following a CEO that could potentially fire us, because that's how people think God works. Oh, you didn't make the quota today, Ethel? Ah! Oh. <laughs> that's not our father. Our father, like what Nikolai taught me this week, he's the one that logically leaves the night, illogically leaves the night and nine and go for the one. He's the one that would put all of us in green pastures. And if David need rescue and heal, like Richard, you would come on. Peace out. I don't get David. He's that good, good father. Come on, guys. We need to start. Let's start this prayer. When I, when I wanted to find out, well, what did Jesus do when he had disappointments? If you read the Bible, you know Jesus had disappointments. Let me read one of the, the disappointments that he had that challenged him so much. Matthew 14 says in verse 12, it says, John the disciples went into the prison and carried his body away and buried it. Then they left to find Jesus and tell him what had happened. On hearing this, Jesus slipped away privately by the boat to be alone. John the Baptist is his first cousin, I believe, or second cousin. John the Baptist is the person who baptized him. John the Baptist was pretty much a great brother in the Lord to Jesus. Can you imagine that? Who identified and released the Father's heart. God used John the Baptist's ministry to kickstart Jesus' ministry. And he hears that John the Baptist has been put to death, beheaded, because he stood for, um, stood for marriage, pretty much. He got beheaded. And Jesus could have get mad with God. He could have continued ministry out of frustration and disappointment. But the Bible says he went alone, took some time. Many of you guys have some hurts. I have it too. I have them. Don't think because Pastor Phyllis got pressure that I don't have problems. I have problems too that I'm working through by faith. And anytime a problem, an issue, a loss on an issue of my heart hurts me, I don't try to go to the world for a solution. I go to my father and I find an alone time in him. And I put on a song just to kickstart my emotion. Today this morning this afternoon about crying because I just need to release some emotion. And when I release that emotion, he puts me in a place that I can hear his voice and say, son, do not be deceived. I'm still with you. Son, don't worry about the drama. Yes, don't worry about it. I'm your daddy and I'm your mama. Come on. You forget who you are when you focus on the negativity of your life. But if you just allow me to minister to you, what would happen? So let me pray for you. If there's anybody here 